And so what we're also seeing is that plastic and our use of plastic and plastic production and plastic pollution uh, is an environmental and social justice issue. Welcome to Facing Future. Today we're going to explore the problem with plastic, a material so ubiquitous we might call our age the plasticine. 99% of it is actually a tangible, unfortunately durable form of fossil fuel. Even though a tiny percentage of it actually gets recycled, most of it breaks down into microparticles that infiltrate and poison the air, the soil, the water, our food, and our bodies. I'm delighted today to welcome Deanna Cohen. Welcome, Deanna. Thank you. She's the co-founder and CEO of the Plastic Pollution Coalition, a nonprofit communications and advocacy organization that collaborates with an expansive global alliance of organizations, businesses, and individuals to create a more just, equitable, regenerative world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impacts. Great to have you with us today, Diana. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dale. Can we start with a look at how these toxic plastics are affecting our health? Sure. Um, well, you already mentioned that plastic is primarily made from fossil fuels. So plastic is made from fossil fuels, oil, fracked and cracked gas. And for that reason, when we look at the entire production chain to produce the plastic, we have to go from extraction and the wellhead to uh, manufacturing and production. If we're designing something with it that's made for a single use item, then it's a very short amount of time that the material is being used for. And then it's instantly a waste management issue. And most often it's either dumped in our environment, which is called landfilling, or mm -hmm. it's burnt in some way, which is called incineration or more kind of euphemistic terms like waste to fuel, waste to energy, but these are all different levels of and ways of burning it. And when we look at that entire chain, we see that along the way, all of that production releases greenhouse gases, contributes to climate change. And uh, when we incinerate it or burn it at the end of life, uh, it releases dioxins and particulate pollutions. Uh, particulate pollution into the air. And so what we're also seeing is that plastic and our use of plastic and plastic production and plastic pollution uh, is an environmental and social justice issue. And it disproportionately impacts rural and low income communities, black and brown communities and indigenous communities. Meaning we work with colleagues and groups and friends in our coalition who are residents of fence line communities and they face serious physical and emotional health risks linked to constant exposure to stress and the chemicals from the production and manufacture of plastic. Sure, it's, it, we're able to put our pollution in, in communities that can't fight back as as well as, as other communities can. It's it, The whole problem of, of climate change is such an environmental justice problem. It's staggering what we've been doing all these years unconsciously or consciously. In, in some cases, as you've mentioned to me, the Keep America Beautiful campaign was a conscious effort to um, obfuscate the, the actual uh, burden of who's doing the polluting by putting it onto uh, consumers, people, oh, you consume this thing now, you better recycle it or you better clean the beach or, you know, um, so that, you know, they're actually, you know, like the tobacco companies, they knew that it was not going to be recyclable. They knew that it was not going to break down and they knew it was toxic. Yeah, I mean, it's the same lobbyists who work for the petrochemical industry and the plastic industry it came from tobacco. <laughs> so. Of course. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, many people don't realize that plastics are petrochemical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same thing that fossil fuels, and it's a way for big oil to maintain itself. You know, if it had to, if it had to go to renewable energy, well, it could still have plastic as a, as a huge, you know, part of its uh, production line. 
Yeah, well, I mean, the petrochemical industry looks at plastic and in particular single use plastics as their plan B. Mm -hmm. so they're watching people divest from investment in fossil fuels, divest from fossil fuels, and they're scrambling because they want to make money. But I mean, it's interesting when you talk about our colleagues and our coalition members who live in fence line communities, oftentimes they live near landfills, which when you live near a landfill, typically you have polluted air, soil, drinking water, and, you know, you experience constant truck, train, barge traffic, you know, um, I, there's, there's the risk of fire, there's the risk of, you know, this kind of air pollution. Our colleagues who work at Fence Line Watch, which is on the Gulf Coast in Houston, there are actual like loudspeakers that announce and they'll have these, these big announcements to the whole community that they need to um, sequester okay. themselves in situ in their house and put towels down to block their doors and windows. And uh, Folks suffer from a lot of a lot of health issues, um, headaches. Um, there's it's a very kind of sweet smell. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity, but a few years ago I had the opportunity to take a toxic tour mm. in Houston of the Gulf Gulf Coast. It's approximately 60, 68 miles long of petrochemical plants. And there's a very kind of sickly sweet smell that you experience and it's coming from all these different chemicals, but it's, it's, it's so hard to imagine. Uh, we have a colleague named Max Lebron and they wrote a book called Pollution is Colonialism. Mm, it is. <laughs> which is a whole topic unto itself, but you know, this is all interconnected and related uh, to everything from gerrymandering and how we vote, so. Well, as I mentioned in the prologue, that it's it's ubiquitous. It's a lot of it is packaging, and I, and I've you know since I knew I was going to talk with you, I, I became very conscious of how much plastic is in my life, and I I looked to see can I buy anything that's not in a plastic bag, that's not in a plastic container, that you know uh, yogurt, you know it doesn't even you it's a number five you know which can't be recycled. And I think, how can you possibly get away from this? And, and, you know, maybe you can, you know, buy just fresh vegetables for, for food and, you know, cosmetics, forget it. They're all in, you know, some kind of plastic container, toothpaste or whatever. Everything, everything is packaged in plastic. Are there alternatives? Or how do we get away from this? Is there a road forward? I, yeah, there, I mean, there's a huge movement of alternatives. When we co-founded Plastic Pollution Coalition back in 2009, there were only a couple businesses that joined us our first year, or our second year, but now in our 14th year, we're about 50% businesses, 50% organizations coming from 75 different countries around the globe. So what's interesting is to see the huge rise in companies that are slowly building, you know, clientele, pr uh, providing products that are packaged in glass, in aluminum, in steel, in, in, are are refillable, also using um, bamboos and woods and making alternatives to plastics and to polystyrene out of mushroom and mushroom mycelium um, and algae and seaweed. I mean, there's a lot, I mean, it's like the wild, wild west. I, I've been saying this for a while. It's so exciting, but there are really cool things happening. Like for example, with toothpaste, there are companies that are doing it there are tubes in aluminum. There are companies that are making um, a kind of toothpaste that is has the water taken out of it. So they're just these little, they almost look like little candies or something. Um, and they come in little, small glass containers and you can put it in your mouth and chew it up a little bit with some, add a little water to it with your toothbrush. There are bamboo toothbrushes instead of plastic toothbrushes. I mean, there are all kinds of very cool things. And it may seem like a small thing, but you know, if 10 people do it, if 50 people do it, if a hundred people do it, it, you create a wave and you create a wave of change. And as these companies begin to scale up in the products that they're creating and understand the demand from the public to buy things packaged in non-toxic and bio-benign materials like glass, <laughs> you know, then they, 
they make that more available. Hopefully people help invest in what they're doing and help them scale to bring it to, to make it available for more people and to bring the price down. Well, you know, the best thing would be if we could reuse containers, you know, it does take energy to recycle glass, um, but glass can be recycled um, and eventually it can break down into its uh, components. But um, if we Gail, could- I'm going to interrupt just for one second. Glass can also just be washed or sterilized and refilled. Yeah. 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 You can wash it. And that's what people used to do. They would wash the container, bring it back. You know, you leave your milk bottles. That's the famous one, uh, which I remember as a child doing on our doorstep. But um, the idea of reusing a container is has just evaporated. You know, we just so used to, the, oh, I have a container and throw it away. And that idea that you could recycle it, that you could throw it away is, is really kind of an evil uh idea because it's not true you can't actually recycle that it doesn't actually go away there's no such thing as a way no exactly i mean but, which doesn't dissolve that's <laughs> right i mean and the thing is too that um you know who sold the public and marketed to the public this idea of a way uh -huh. because as you said there is no way and then plastic you know all of these companies the petrochemical companies and the plastic companies and the companies that package their food and beverages and beauty products and health food products and cleaning products in these materials have been perpetuating a kind of greenwashing. And frankly, it's a lie. The chasing arrow symbols and the numbers do not mean that something is recyclable. Plastic was never designed to be recycled. It is still not designed to be recycled. Those numbers in the chasing arrow only show you, they help designate what kind of plastic it is. And seven represents other, all the others. So, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. And I think the public is waking up to that. And, you know, I know that there are also um, legal proceedings and lawsuits being mm -hmm. brought against companies. And in particular, you know, even the attorney general of California here in California has filed a suit, uh, begun an investigation uh, mm -hmm. looking into ExxonMobil and the petrochemical companies who claimed that their, the products they were making, the plastic products were recyclable when they're not. Now, can I could you clarify, can one and two actually be recycled? Um, there may be somewhat of a market for, for one and two. But, and at some point, I think there was also for five, but as far as I know, people are not necessarily there. There's not, you need to have the infrastructure to support recycling. If the infrastructure to support it doesn't exist, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you could recycle it. It doesn't matter if you do recycle it. And I'm not trying to dissuade people from putting it. If you are lucky enough to live in a community that has a blue bin, you know, and I have lots of friends who live five, 10 blocks away from me who don't have a blue bin in their neighborhood. But if you're lucky enough to live in a community that has one, then we do put things in that. And it's a little bit, I call it wish cycling. We hope that something is done with this material, but I'm not, I'm, I'm, I am not, I, I mean, I can't tell you that something is actually done with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, everybody should take tours of the recycling centers and ask them questions and find out what's going on. And, and honestly, in all fairness, it's not the fault of the recycling centers. I think there are materials that have value, but I think the whole problem is the way that we've come to look at things. Um, I have a lot of colleagues who work on zero waste projects. That's fantastic. I think we need to go beyond the concept of zero waste to 100% valuable materials. Mm -hmm. And I've seen wonderful models in the Philippines of um, communities that did like a big communication push with their own community. First, they were paying to have all their waste hauled away, right? Mm -hmm. And probably buried or dumped in a landfill or incinerated. The next thing they did is they became a pilot project for a zero waste city. And in doing that, they developed communications to work with their whole community and say, look, these are the materials that we all use that have value, but they only have value if they're pristine. 
So can you separate everything? And most importantly, your organic food waste, keep that in one place and bring it to, or put it in a particular place. So what they did is they created localized compost facilities and they're creating the most beautiful soil I've ever seen using food scrap and fruit, fruit and vegetable waste. Uh, and they are keeping the paper and the metals um, and the uh, wood and the cardboard and the glass and these other materials separate from that. So it's not being sullied uh, mm -hmm. and it has value and it can either be sterilized and refilled or it can be used in some way that it still has value. But I mean, what people need to realize is anything that we're going to recycle is actually just being downcycled. It's not really being, I mean, perhaps glass, if it's clear and doesn't have other metals or chemicals added to it. Could be broken down. Yeah. Some of its fundamental properties and becomes less um, usable. Well, I mean, even plastic, the ones one and two, if they're chipped or broken apart um, to be broken down, they can, from what I understand, I've been told you can only use up to 30% recycled material or else the polymer chain is not strong enough. So you have to add an extra 70% that's, uh, that's virgin material. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to, to me, that's not recycling. I don't know what you call that. It needs another name. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it, it seems like we really have to get away from the whole plastic paradigm uh, completely. I, you know, when you look at something, buying something, you say, oh, I need some outdoor chairs. I think I'll look at those nice plastic chairs or that nice plastic, whatever, um, you know, or that fence that, oh, that's so durable. Um, you know, people have to be a little more conscious of uh, let's not <laughs> buy those things anymore. Let's just stop. We, we didn't know. Now we know. Don't buy things that are made of plastic. Um, stop stop doing it um you know a lot of the problem of our of our uh, climate crisis is that we consume so much and plastic is certainly no exception we consume way too much of it you know I, I, when i see disaster relief and i look at all those crates of plastic water bottles and plastic containers of food i mean those people need that but surely we could create something better you know that it all because all of those are now going to pollute their environment, which already had problems. Now it has another problem, all tons and tons of plastic bottles and packaging. Um, well, um, there's a big movement to to provide filters for people, not bottles, uh, for both disaster relief and even in this whole movement with the the funding from the Biden administration to uh, renovate and replace all the lead pipes in the United States. So there's a big push and campaign to called filtered not bottles, uh, filters not bottles, mm -hmm. to encourage people and provide them filters to use that will filter the water for the few days it takes to replace the pipes. Linings and, and things leaches into our, our food. Uh, it, yeah, it all does. I mean, uh, and there are different chemicals used. The plasticizing chemicals that are used to make plastics include bisphenols. So you might have heard, oh, this is okay because this is BPA free. But I've had meetings with the Center for Disease Control and the Endocrine Disruption Department. And what they've pointed out to me is the replacements for BPA, BPB, BPS, BPZ are equally bad, if not worse, to BPA. And then the other group of chemicals that are added are called phthalates. Bisphenols are added to make the plastic clear and transparent and kind of rigid uh, to give it those qualities, shape it. And then the phthalates are added to make it soft and malleable and kind of mushy like rubber. So those are the two groups of chemicals that go in. But um, phthalates have also been identified uh, by UC Irvine as obesogens. They make our bodies hold more fat. And um, bisphenols and BPA probably has been studied the most has been linked to obesity and diabetes, to respiratory issues, to reproductive and hormone problems, uh, including sterility, infertility, and um, lower sexual function. Uh, they, I just was reading something this morning about forever chemicals, PFAS chemicals, PFOAs. Mm -hmm. um, those are added to plastic things to make them waterproof um, or 
oftentimes flame retardant. Um, and those chemicals have just been uh, linked in studies to um, affecting testes size. Um, and then these chemicals have also been linked to breast cancer, brain cancer, and prostate cancer. Wow. You, you think of the, the toys that children have, the little plastic things that they're chewing on. Right, which are heavily phthalated. And phthalates have been identified, as I said, as obesogens. And these chemicals have been linked to obesity and diabetes and kids are putting them in their mouths and chewing on them. So can't be good. I mean, we haven't tested children, but they have tested umbilical cord blood and um, they, they have found microplastics and microparticles and chemicals from plastic in umbilical cord blood. And those chemicals, again, BPA studies have been linked to shorten anogenital distance, uh, smaller penis size, feminization of boys, so boys getting breasts, early menses and girls, and lower IQ. Wow, that's quite a laundry list. <laughs> um, there, there's some legislation around to try to um, rein in this disaster that is upon us. There's a, some federal legislation. California has some laws. Canada just passed some laws. Um, mm -hmm. What what are what what are we what's in the pipeline there in terms of the plastics? Well, I mean, there's some exciting stuff here in California. We've made a lot of progress. Um, Governor Newsom recently signed 40 different bills into law that were all environmental bills. Um, in September of 2022, the California government began testing state drinking water for microplastics. It's the California's government is the first government in the world to do so. Um, in July of 2022 this year, Governor Newsom also passed plastic legislation that addresses some of the core issues of the problem, such as addressing sweeping uh, issues, which started with SB 54, which is a great start. It's by eliminating the most problematic, least recyclable, and most polluting single-use plastics, though we really feel that much more should be done. And then, as I mentioned before, in April this year, a, a California Attorney General Rob Bontas uh, launched this investigation, its first of its kind, into the plastic and petrochemical industry's role in driving the plastic crisis. So basically saying they knew mm -hmm. that it wasn't recyclable. And yet this is the messaging and the communication that they use. So that's what's happening in California. Then at the federal level in the United States, we've got the Federal Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. And that's really exciting. It was um, uh, brought out in 2021 and it builds on successful statewide laws across the US that outline practical plastic reduction strategies to realize a healthier, more sustainable, more equitable future. The federal bill was sponsored by Senator Jeff Merkley from Oregon and Representative uh, Alan Lowenthal from California, and it represents the most comprehensive set of policy solutions to the plastic pollution crisis that have ever been introduced in Congress so far. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to just say that plastic is often cleaned up at the public's expense. Oh, yeah, and, of course. And, and that the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act would save local and municipal governments billions of dollars by shifting the cost of waste management to the producers. Mm -hmm. so basically moving towards like a true full cost accounting, then that'll provide a competitive advantage to businesses that are committed to these appropriate policies. Great. And that would be great. Uh, what chances does it have? I wonder. Um, I think elements of it have a lot of chances and they're also work being worked into other bills. I mean, the good news is that if we can really create a robust reuse and refill system, that will not only create new lots of new jobs for people, it's gonna create better, healthier jobs. And the studies we've seen so far uh, that jobs that are in the zero waste sector go beyond basic manual labor and they provide higher wages and offer more permanent positions for people. So we could go to a better, cleaner and a healthier world if we would uh, get these things uh, taken care of. Um, wow, plastic. Um, I mean, you, wait, you also mentioned Canada and in June of this year, 
um, the government of Canada published this super, it's called super is the acronym. It's the single use plastics prohibition regulations. <laughs> and um, they launched it in the Canada Gazette. And for their whole part two, they said the regulations officially prohibit by the end of 2023, the manufacture, import, and sale of six single-use items identified in the proposed regulation. And it includes plastic checkout bags, plastic cutlery, plastic foodware, uh, food service ware that's made from or containing problematic plastics, plastic ring carriers, so the things on like a six-pack, mm -hmm. and plastic stir sticks and plastic straws. Wow. Good. <laughs> Which is I'm, exciting. It is exciting because, you, you know, you see those things on the beach everywhere you go. Uh, horrible. And you see animals stuck in those those rings, you know, the beer can rings. They get their heads stuck in it. Horrible. You know, that's another side of this whole thing is that um, a lot of that stuff is is trapping wildlife and, and wildlife are eating it and then starving to death because plastic doesn't nourish them. Yeah, no, plastic is very, very bad for wildlife and wildlife in the sea as well, sea life, in that it not only can entangle them or they can get their heads or parts of their body stuck in plastic and yogurt containers and things like that. Um, it can also, they can get stuck in something, they can continue to grow and it can strangle them in some way, um, or they eat it and ingest it. And I mean, it used to be that when we first started this work, they were finding plastics and microplastics in 78% of turtle necropsies for sea turtles, but now they find it in 99% mm -hmm. of sea turtles. So we're finding plastic in us. So they've now found plastic and microplastics and microparticles of plastic in human lung tissue, in placenta, both on the mother's side and the baby's side, in, um, yeah, in our, in our blood and in our lungs. So uh, we are breathing it, we are eating it, we are ingesting it, we're finding it in all different kinds of foods as well. And it's kind of, it's kind of like what you said right at the beginning of this conversation, which is that, you know, are we living, it's, it's not just the Anthropocene, we're living in the Plasticine. And I wonder very much if somewhere way in the future, I, hopefully the planet will still, we will have maintained it to be habitable for ourselves, we may not, pull that off, but hopefully some conscious life that comes to the planet in the future won't just see a small layer of colored confetti. <laughs> and that will have been us, plastic confetti. <laughs> I'm yes. hoping that doesn't happen, but that's my dystopian future. Well it seems to be inevitable that there will be a layer of plastic in, in the <laughs> geological record, and that will be us. This is what we made. Um, <laughs> Oh, dear. Well, thank you so much, Deanna. This is a really interesting and a really important issue. I hope that people will become more conscious of buying, not buying plastic. Think about what, you know, what's going to happen with that thing you just bought. Does it go somewhere? Ultimately, can Mother Earth reabsorb that? Or, or if not, then maybe have something else. Well, so. and I would just encourage people to learn as much as they can about the issue if they're interested in it. And I think the most important key is really to do it for your health and the health of your family and your community. And what does that look like? I think it looks like obviously supporting local farmers, supporting local farmers markets, making the choice. If you are in a position of privilege where you can make the choice to purchase things without plastic, it's going to be healthier for you, again, healthier for your family. But taking that up a notch, looking at what's going on in your school, in your place of work, if you have a company or a business, think about changing the materials that you're packaging things in. Or if you have an eatery or you know a break room at, at your place of work, think about investing in reusable ceramic cups or glass mugs or steel mugs or cups for everybody at work so that everyone can reuse things and think about reusing and refilling versus just using up and throwing away because because what people don't think about is that it takes of course resources and energy to make single use things every day and it would be better spent that energy on the planet to just be reusing the same thing over and over again hundreds 
if not thousands of times. So I also welcome everyone to learn more and to join our coalition. Um, it's at, we're at plasticpollutioncoalition.org. And uh, we just launched a new project too that's called Flip the Script on Plastics in Film and Television. And that is really fun and would be fun to learn more about. And we're working with uh, Fran Drescher, who's currently the president of SAG-AFTRA and a number of different um, creative, you know, directors and actors to change the narrative in the storylines, as well as working to measurably reduce the plastic footprint on set and in production. Well, we're all waiting for that line where Dustin Hoffman's uh, uncle doesn't say, <laughs> or when he says plastic, he means get rid of it. <laughs> but I encourage everybody to rise to the challenge as an individual in your school, in your place of work, and then, of course, vote and support policy and legislation that will help drive the change that we need. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks very much, Deanna. Great to talk. Sure. With you. My pleasure. Nice to talk with you. Mm -hmm.